In this week's podcast, I'm joined by the Scotland captain Andy Robertson, a player whose story is a scriptwriter's dream. From being released by Celtic, working in the kit room in Hamden, to lifting the Champions League with Liverpool, all in a matter of years, it's a footballing fairy tale. This is Curry Club, the Scottish Football Sessions. Andy, really good to see you and to get to chat about your career. I know you're only 28, but it feels like you've achieved an awful lot in the game to this point. I'll go back to the start, but can I start on the recent past? Congratulations, I believe you're just married. Yeah, thank you. A long time coming, probably. Um, Covid caused a couple of problems with it, but yeah, done and dusted, and yeah, good. That's, that's you know that's another thing ticked off. How were the uh, how were the boys in the day? Because I've seen the, the team photo now has been released. I'm sure you've you've noticed on some sort of social forum now all the boys there <clears throat> suited and booted. Yeah, the boys were looking good. To be fair, boys looked sharp. Trent's trousers were a wee bit baggy, but I think that was the look he was going for. <laughs> um, but yeah, the lads lads looked well. Um, they had a good time, I think, and yeah, I think we all had uh, we all had a really good day. Best man speech, good. Yeah, it was my you brother. It. Oh, it good. Was my brother. So, uh, best man speech was was good. Told a couple of tales about when I was a wee bit younger, <laughs> um, back in the day. And um, yeah, no, it was uh, it was good. Got a got a couple of tears as well out of certain oh, people. So um, yeah, it was uh, it was a good one. It's good. I got married a few years ago, but I think it always gives you a chance to kind of reflect a bit, doesn't it, on your on your friends, your friend groups, how they've changed down the years, and also your career. So maybe this is good timing because you've just been married to be able to go back to the start now. I mean, I remember hearing your name being mentioned when you were at Queen's Park when you were 18 years old, but the story starts well before that. When did football become the first love for you? Who, you got, who got you into it? Um, obviously, I've got, you know, I've got a big brother. I've got, you know, my dad loved football. Um, my uncles, my cousins, you know, it was just, I was kind of brought up about, with football. Um, my first steps, my mum and dad always talk about it. It was my first birthday when I was, you know, I took like three steps towards a ball and maybe that was maybe that was a sign. But, you know, probably it was just more colourful and I wanted to get my hands on it. But, like, it's ever since I've known, do you know what I mean? Football's always been the way for me. Especially when you live in that part of the world. Yeah, exactly. You know, I've always been, and I've always been, I was always an active child. I always had to be, you know, occupied mm -hmm. and football was a good way. So, um, you know, I was always out in the back garden, always always playing with my brother, always playing with my mates in the street and things like that. And yeah, I've just, you know, my earliest memories are probably when I was four, joining my first little team, playing four aside and things like that, and just, just running about with shorts and t-shirt far too big for you and things like that. But, you know, football's just the way of my life and it always has been. And um, yeah, it's it's not as if one day I just woke up and decided it was, you know, from the start, it was just, you know, a ball was always my friend. Yeah. and. Um, you know, I just always tried to tried to play with it. Thank goodness, best friend ever. I think yeah, yeah. after what's happened now. Yeah, uh, forward on a few years from that, then you're a youth team player with Celtic. It didn't happen for you at Celtic. Uh, you read the stories that you were released because you were too small. I mean, is that actually what they said to you at the time? Was it as clear as that? I think height was a part of it. Also, physicality. I wasn't exactly the the muscliest. I wasn't. I wasn't actually. I wasn't really built and things like that. So. You know, obviously I, there was a change, you know, I, I got released when there was a, you know, a kind of big change at Celtic. Yeah. That summer quite a lot of players got released at all ages. At that age it's, it's not make or break, but it's, you know, do I go full-time football or do I get released? That's the two options you've yeah. got, you've not got anywhere else to turn, so. What were the options after that then? Because that was 15, you really started to make your mark at Queen's Park. At 18, obviously an amateur club as well. So what happened in the meantime? Was there ever a point you thought, this might just not happen for me? To be honest, when when I was 15, getting let go from you know the biggest club in Scotland, or certainly one of the two, and there wasn't many people that um, that were there. Queens Park was obviously local to me. Um, was I still at school, yeah. so it was it was fairly easy. I worked at the I worked at the concerts and the big football matches and things like that. And then, you know, when it was uh, when it was 18, it was it was decision time. I'd left. You know, school was finished. Did I want to go to college? Did I want to try and go to university? Did I want to further my education? Or I was very fortunate that my mum and dad allowed me to, to have a year out. Yeah. Man, he was hugely instrumental yeah. in that. Managed to convince my mum and dad that um, she was always convinced that I was going to make it. Don't know why, because <laughs> certainly really? at times it didn't, yeah. it, it didn't um, see that way. And It's amazing how important the family, I know it's an obvious thing to say, but the family, the people that keep driving you on at this time in your life. Yeah. And, you know, that's the only regret of my career. She, you know, when I was at Dundee United, she mm -hmm. sadly passed away too yeah. quickly and she didn't quite manage to see, you know, the journey that I went on. You know, she seen me play 
first team football, which was incredible. She went to every Dundee United game and things like that. But there's many reasons why I love playing for Scotland. But that's certainly one of them that drives me forward through the good times and the bad times. She'll be so proud, no doubt. <laughs> Absolutely, no doubt. So at Queen's Park, then eventually at 18, you start to make your way. You're working behind the scenes at the same time, is that right? They set you up with a job at that point because you're playing for an amateur football club. So I think this is the famous time and I think everyone looks back at the tweet <laughs> now that you put out, need a job sort of thing. Yeah. Um, luckily, um, the guy at Queen's Park, Andy McLennan, he won't like his name getting mentioned because <laughs> he's certainly more behind the scenes, but he was, he was massive for me. You know, yeah. he says, look, we want to try and help you get to where you want to be. And, and he, he worked in the, you know, with the Hamden debenture holders and things yeah. like that. And he says, come work for me. You know, that season I tried to focus on building myself up a little, trying to get a bit stronger, working on certain things, working on my weaknesses. And so I'd done that for six months because obviously Queen's Park, I was on, what, 18 quid a week. Yeah. It covered my petrol and um, and that was it. And uh, that's not enough to, to keep you going. So, and then the last six months at Queen's Park, I, I worked in the kit room uh, for the Scotland team. So I was doing that again, you know, work experience, actually one of the, one of the kit men that was my boss now works here. It's, it's, right? Yeah, he's, he, work, he works here, so it's a bit, uh, it's a bit strange. But that means uh, you have to spend some time in the kit room. Well, yeah, exactly. All the time. Always, always, always speak to him. So, um, but yeah, so like these things all shaped me mm -hmm. to be, and I knew that if the year at Queens Park didn't work out, then I would, I would need to step back from it and go for more educational stuff because I couldn't waste any more time. I think that's why I love this story so much and been able to tell it here because you, you play for the club that plays at Hampden Park, you're working behind the scenes in the, in the kit room at Hampden Park, you go on to captain the country. Yeah. It's one of the best stories, but like, we'll get to that because that year you had at Queen's Park, I was actually working back then on the TV, different broadcaster, but working on the games in the third division at the time because Rangers, as you know, were uh, starting their journey back up the leagues. I remember at the start of the season, um, in close season, I was away with my pals, as you do, sixth year holiday, yeah. all that nonsense. <laughs> and. Uh, I got a phone call off Gardner Spears at the time and says, I want you to come away with the first, because at that time I was just going second year under right. 19s. I phoned my mum and dad straight away. I was like, get me home. I need mm. to come home. I can't be here because I was in Malia and Greece, obviously, you know what sure, goes on in there. And I'm thinking, get me home. I need, <laughs> I need to get back, but um, the, the the flights were too expensive. They'd shot right up. We couldn't, we couldn't afford to get oh, back. So. No. We knew there was going to be a lot more exposure on the third division. We knew games were going to be on telly. We knew scouts were going to be watching, things like that. So I thought, this is my chance, you know, I'm not going to get a better chance because the third division gets watched. Queen's Park in particular gets yeah. gets watched for young players and things like that. But with Rangers in it, this is the time, mm -hmm. you know, this is the time to to really try and establish yourself. So I just tried to always improve, always try and take tips on board from the experienced lads. You know, I still look at them today and, you know, thank, you know, thank them any time I come across them and things. and. You know, it's weird because some of them think, you know, why is he thanking me? You know, he's at Liverpool and things. But I, I, I don't see it as that. You know, I see it as I was a young boy at Queen's Park and they lads helped me massively. You'll never forget the steps. And I'll never yeah. and I'll never forget it. You know, as soon as I'm as soon as I met Jackie at Dundee United at St Andrews, um, you know, I fell in love with the setup and you know, my mind was really made up that I wanted to go there. It was a really good team to join as well because we're talking about kind of scouts watching Queen's Park, but all of a sudden Dundee United, different league quite clearly in the top flight, but Everybody was watching at the time because Stuart Armstrong was in the team. Ryan Gold, meant to be the next superstar at the time, everyone was saying was in that team. John Souter, John Souter others yeah. as well. I mean, that is a seriously talented young group of players. And we know what's happened now, how they've all developed as well. I always remember my first day I walked into the, uh, the under 20s changing room and Jackie came out and got, he said, No, no, you're, you're in it. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, from that first day, that gave me the confidence because I was thinking, Okay, maybe, you know, maybe I'm going to be under 20s mm -hmm. for the first year. I don't, I, I don't know what's going to happen. but. Yeah, there was a lot of people watching and keeping a close eye and, you know, I think we all just kind of fed off it. Mm. We all just got excited by it and didn't really shy away from it. And, you know, I think that's probably why, you know, the boys get good moves. Yeah, it looked like you had a lot of fun as well. Uh, roommates who you were living with at the time. And there's this great photo you've probably seen lots down the years. Of, I think Joe McGovern was part yeah. of this four. <laughs> Did you guys having a kickabout down by the banks of the Tay? You know, at, at that age, we were just... We just didn't like care, not not in a good way. I mean, like just love the game. Now, now there's not a chance me and any of the lads are no. going to play a five a side game. Do you know what I mean? Not a chance. There's like we protect our body. We try, and, but at that age we're just like, right, what we're going to do this afternoon? Nice day, right? Do you want? Know let's go. Let's go to Tesco, buy a set of goals, go down to the park. Mm. And it was just, and that's the way it was. We were just so relaxed. We used to play, you know, two touch on our patio and things like that out in the front garden, like. It was just we all we just all came together, you know, the four of us in that house and. 
just tried to help each other. And when it came to time to leave, I wasn't ready. Mm. I, I, I admit that I wasn't ready to leave. I wanted to stay, but you know, sometimes these things are the right thing to do. And ultimately, how tough the decision was, mm. it was the right decision. Almost won the Scottish Cup that season. Also, the season you make your Scotland debut, you briefly mentioned it. There was the Poland game, wasn't it? You impressed Gordon Strachan. Yeah, um, getting called up to your country is a dream come true, especially when you've only been a pro for seven mm. months. It's, it's stuff dreams are made of. It's stuff that I could never, ever imagined. I always remember pulling the way, you know, my family came out, things like that. 60 minutes, I'm getting warmed up, Strachan's like going like that. And like, <laughs> me, like, and he's like, yeah, yeah. And he just, <clears throat> on the side of the pitch, I remember him just saying, the only thing I want you to do is play your own game. If you make mistakes, no problem, but I don't want you to... I don't want you to go into a shell. I don't play your own game. And I always remember I took their words on. I took their words from them onto the pitch. One ball came to me straight away and I just drove with it 40 yards. I always yeah. remember it. Gordon still talks about this, by the way. Yeah, and he spoke about it after the game and he was like, you know, that's that's no fear and things like that. And then, you know, Gordon was amazing with me. He was, he still is. I still speak to him. And um, But, you know, he was, he was a fantastic manager for me, fantastic kind of person that I could call upon and yeah that was the start of my Scotland journey and mm -hmm. you know here we are today and I've walked by the gaffer and said gaffer do you want one and he was like if you ever do that again then me and you will have big problems and I was like what like I didn't know what he was talking yeah. about because it was that it was like <laughs> nine days ago I was like he's like bringing beers on the bus he says you don't ever do that I don't care who told you to do it didn't want to leave Dundee United at the time, but the opportunity came. Stan Turnant, I think, uh, was the scout who was watching Stuart Armstrong at Dundee United game, I think he's since said. And then you caught the eye and he went right back to Steve Bruce and said, you got to sign him. Yeah, he was sitting next to he was sitting next to my agent. Um, when we put, I always remember the story, we were playing Hibs away. Mm. Five minutes into the game, he shut his book, closed over his book, and Stan supposedly just said to him on the phone, yeah, proper player, we'll be in in the summer, and that was it. Mm. But you went to Hull. How did you feel about moving to England at that age? I wasn't sure. Um, to be honest, when I went down, I said to everyone, I was like, I'll go down and have a look. Mm -hmm. I remember I said to the Dundee United chairman at the time, I said, oh, I'll be back Monday, I'll see you. He's like, no, you won't. Stephen? <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm sure he'd have been he delighted. Like, he's like, no, you won't. So I was like, all right. But I went down, <laughs> um, I went down, spoke to Steve Bruce, basically fell in love with the project mm -hmm. straight away. Yeah, I was sitting in the hotel, I went to bed, didn't really sleep, and I was thinking, I don't know if I, I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know if I, I don't know if I can do it. More Did so. Did you feel ready? No, no. Honestly, no. I didn't. I didn't feel ready. Because this was straight into the Premier League. Well, when you're in Scotland, you know the Premier League has spoke up to being mm. this massive, and, and it is. Mm. It, it's a massive league. But you know, I, I think also part of the Scottish problem and things like that is you know we don't back ourselves mm. enough. We we always think negatively before positively. I think so. Glorious failure. Yeah, exactly. But that was. In this moment, that's exactly how I acted. Yeah. I was thinking, I don't think I'm ready, you know? And I always remember my mum and dad after it, they said, oh, son, we never slept either. We were so worried you weren't going to do it and everything like that. And not just because they thought, you know, mm. don't give up the opportunity of the Premier yeah. League, you know? So luckily, you know, the next day I spoke to the manager for a good hour in the training ground. Um, he spoke, he says, look, you're ready. You are ready for this challenge. You're ready to play for us. You're ready to play for... You know, in the Premier League, and I thought, yeah, do you know what? If he's if he's got belief in me, a manager like that, then you know, I have to, I have to have belief in myself. But the squad was incredible. It was. You know, we had Harry you know, Maguire. Yeah, Harry signed same day as me. Yeah. Harry signed same day as me, and things like that. So it was like all these players, and it was just it was um, it was a good squad, mm. you know. And obviously, we fell short first season, got relegated. Yeah. But the second season was massive for me. That mm. was the biggest season I've ever had in terms of learning in terms of playing so many games. I think I played the most in the squad. Was Steve Bruce a big influence? Because I've heard some stories, a bit of a character, I think because some of the teammates as well, but were you set up royally one day, bringing beers onto the team bus? Yep, set up yep, by the older lads. Um, won't mention any names, but it was certainly... Well, the, I think they can imagine. Certainly it was Irish and Scottish, I <laughs> you'd say of them, but yeah, I remember the first season, um, we, had a day, we had a day out of the races. Um, the gaffer was trying to bring us all together. One of the lads says, "You're the youngest here. Stop at the garage, get beers, right?" So I've walked on. I've walked on the bus with the beers. The carry out. And I've walked by the gaffer and I said, "Gaffer, do you want one?" And he was like really frosty with me, and like he, he wasn't ever really like that with me. And I'm thinking, "Oh no!" Nah, like, so anyway, go up the back of the bus. The lads have the beers. They're happy. Blah 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 blah. He left that week, and uh, we played a game at the weekend. I think we might have actually won. Pulled me in on the Monday. 
if you ever do that again, then me and you will have big problems. And I was like, what? You, like I didn't know what he was talking yeah. about because it was that. It was like yeah. nine days ago. I was. He's like bringing beers on the bus. He says you don't ever do that. I don't care who told you. It. Blah blah blah. Oh, it went went off when I was like. Oh, uh, like sorry, gaffer, not that. Like to be fair to some of the older lads, they tried to protect me. Right, they tried. He to, was serious. Uh, oh, yeah, he was deadly serious. I, oh, the way I read the story, by no, the way, the way it was no, being no, no, told no, no. Well, this time, was that he was having you on. No, this time he was deadly serious. Oh, you learned fast. And he went, eh? and he, and he, and as I left, as I was walking out the room, I'm like obviously like shaking basically. <laughs> and he's like, oh, and uh, Robbo, yeah. well played at the weekend, son, right? And I just, <laughs> and that was him. Do you know what I mean? I ended up going out laughing and yeah. uh, everything like that, and uh, that was it, finished. But the, the time he had me on was um, the playoff final. Right. Won the playoff final. I've came on, youngest again, yeah. dafty, not learning my lessons, came on with it, like a massive crate of beer. And I've walked by the gaffer and he's like, do you never learn your lessons? <laughs> Swearing at me, everything. <laughs> what are you doing? Blah, 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 blah. He's like, give me a beer. He's like, give me a beer. What a season, all this. And then like, we all, like everyone erupted because I'm like, I was, like getting, I was getting ready to turn around and take the beers <laughs> off the bus. He's like, not this time. No. He was, he was, but he was delighted. That's really the time he had yeah. me on. But um, he was honestly amazing for me. And mm. honestly, every time I see him, I just, you know, I just want to talk to him for the whole night. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? He's, he's such a likeable guy. Yeah. He makes you, you want to run through a brick wall for him. I remember there was a lot of talk, a few rumours at the time that Liverpool might be coming in. Did you know at that point? Yeah, so the talks at Liverpool were, were ongoing. Right. They were positive. I never believed I was signing until I was in Melwood. Yeah. Do you know what I mean, I never, I, I never allowed myself to believe. I ended up going back to back to Hull for pre-season, yeah. which at that time it was very uncertain. You know, I maybe had to force it a wee bit. It was so hard to leave, but I knew it was my time. You know, at Dundee United, a bit different. I didn't think it was my time. At Hull, I knew, you know, three good years. Obviously, unfortunately, got relegated. Um, all the uncertainty off the field and things like that. I knew it was kind of time to and try. You knew, and you knew the team that were coming calling as well. Well, exactly. You know, I couldn't really tell people that at the time because I didn't want to. I didn't want myself to believe it, so I didn't want other people to believe yeah. it. So I couldn't really jump about and say, like, you know, Liverpool are interested. Uh, I would do anything to move there. I couldn't quite say that yet. So, luckily, the next couple of weeks it happened. What, what was the manager like at the time? What was he like in the early days? He's not changed. You know, he always says, mm. "Look, Robbo, you need time. You need to do this. You need to do that." Always gave me stuff to work on. You know, when I spoke to the gaffer, I was like, how did I get closer? You know, I always wanted to know how did I get closer to being in your squad? That was the start, because yeah. I wasn't in the squads. So it always gave me something to work on. You know, it always gave me, in training, something, right, okay, I need to do this, I need to do that, or whatever, and that will get me closer. And I just knew when that time came, I was in the best possible place to try and make, try and to make that count. Obviously, the circumstances that happened you know, Alberto getting injured, yeah. never nice. When he did get injured, I think he ended up being out for about eight to ten weeks. I yeah. thought, well, here's my chance. Now It's now or never, you know. This is your chance to prove to everyone that you can play for Liverpool. And there's not many players that get the opportunity to play for a club like this. Yeah. And I'm very fortunate that I'm in that small percentage. And every minute, I always try and make it count because I know one day I won't be good enough for this club. Whatever, whatever day that comes, whether I'm too old, whether I'm not good enough, whether that one day will come and you don't want to look back with any regrets and, you know, I'm blessed to be here, I love it here and I don't want it to end and I know I need to be at my best to, to, to not allow that to happen. Within two years of being here, you're a Champions League winner. That's seven years on from what we were talking about at the start of your career, which is just a ridiculous pace to go on that journey, isn't it? I also remember being pitch side with Steven Gerrard doing one of the, the early Liverpool games and I said to him, you know Liverpool have never won the league without a Scottish player on their team. And and he's the, he's the final piece in the jigsaw. But I think everyone was starting to believe it. And of course, you go on and win the league as well. Of all the amazing achievements here at Liverpool, what are you most proud of so far? You know, winning the Champions League is stuff boys dream of. You yeah. know, like like I go back to the start when I'm in the back garden and that we used mm -hmm. to we used to try and you know pretend we've won the Champions League with <laughs> Henrik Larsson scoring a goal. I mean, that's what that's what me and my brother done. Yeah. But for here. Liverpool, the day you signed for this club, you day, every day you bump into a fan, um, you realised how much they wanted the Premier League. You realised it was, it got to a point where it was desperation. Yeah. You know, it was. It, you could see it, you know, the Liverpool fans we have in this, in, in the training ground before it, I was like, oh, we need to win the league, we need to win the league, we need to win the league. And everything was obsessed with winning the league and I can completely get it. To have the two trophies. Oh. And you know, and, strangest of and seasons local... as well, of course, when you yeah. won the Premier League without the fans and everything yeah, was... that happened this season. Just as well, you had all the fans behind the scenes. Yeah, well, driving you on here. Well, exactly. You know, they people were crucial because they were the ones that we couldn't have interactions with any of the other fans. But the good thing was as well was, 
you know, before COVID, the game we had against Man United. Mm -hmm. We didn't win the league that day, but we had the moment with the fans. The fans left that stadium thinking, we are not going to mess this up. And to be honest, so did we. You know, we couldn't, we couldn't admit it, but I walked away from that stadium thinking, nah, like this is, disaster has to strike. And the way, the mentality we had of the boys, the mindset that we all had, but the, like, especially like the captain and everything, the mindset he had of just driving us forward, driving us forward in the times, I just thought, nah, this is it. The friendships we've, we've talked about as well throughout your kind of journey, if you like, different clubs, Queen's Park, Dundee United, Hull as well. Some of the, the mates you've got here, I mean, it just seems like it clicked at the start. I mean, I think we've all seen videos of you and Trent together and some of the antics that go on. I mean, it does seem like it's a brilliant atmosphere behind the scenes. At times in the season, you see these lads more than you see your own family, you know, and that's the truth of it. If you don't have a good relationship with them or you don't have a good changing room, then it can make it difficult. We're so fortunate that we have a lot of different nationalities, a lot of different personalities, but we all we all have a common ground. We all manage to find, you know, things that we can laugh about, things that we can, you know, talk seriously about, things we can... And we have a fantastic group, you know, there's no... There's no egos for starters, you know, the lads, it's the team first, that's, that's the fact. You are only 28, you've achieved a lot, but you talk about the future, one day you'll know you're not going to be good enough for this football club. Do you ever wonder what comes next? Is there ever a move back in the cards, back to Scotland? Is there anything you want to finish off that maybe you didn't achieve early in your career? Yeah. You know where I'm going? Yeah, yeah I, know, I know where you're going with this, but it's um, every time I watch Celtic, I consider it. I, you know, I'd, when you when you watch them and, you know, you see a packed Celtic yeah. park and things like that, as a fan, you know, you always have that dream. I, ideally, I want to finish my career here. If I can stay at the top yeah. of my game and, and, and the top, you know, the top of the tree for my whole career, then, I, I, you know, that that's the route I want to go down. But also, when I look at Celtic and when I was growing up and things, I look at Celtic and I think I wanted to give my best years. You know, when I was at Queen's Park and that and dreaming of still playing with Celtic and, that and maybe finishing what I, I always dreamt of giving my best years to Celtic. And now I don't want to go as a, a 34, 35 year old old guy that my uncle start hating on because <laughs> I can't move anymore, you know? So look, time time will tell. Uh, I'm very much of a, a person that lives in the moment. I uh, enjoy, I don't look too far ahead and you know, I don't often look back. That's why these things are always quite enjoyable because I never sit down and look back. There'll be a time for that, but... Um, Thank goodness you've done it today. Yeah, exactly. This yeah. would have been a long interview. Yeah, exactly. But... We filmed the time. Andy, you're doing amazingly well. And what a pleasure to chat to you. Wish you all the future success. Thank you very much. Thank you very you much, got me through it with a bad back. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> Cheers, man. Thank you.